Hello, 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 it's Carol Ann Chapman. Welcome to this very exciting episode of my past life memory of having been a black woman in pre-colonial Africa. Now, obviously I'm a white woman now, however, this is before Europeans were even in Africa. So any thoughts you have about this being about racial discrimination in the United States or anything of that nature has nothing to do with these past life memories of mine. Just as last week I was talking about memories of having been a gay man in a past life. Again, that has nothing to do with a kind of discrimination that goes on nowadays. In fact, in today's live stream, the highlights are going to be, number one, almost being eaten by cannibals, almost. Secondly, experiencing my death. And it was actually a, a very nice experience. And third, finding some proof of what I'd experienced in that past life. So in this memory of mine, I had been in a dugout canoe. It was nighttime. It was very dark. There was a moon. We were so black skinned that all you could see of us at night was the whites of our eyes and our teeth. And so at night, if we were hunting, it was very important to keep your mouth shut because then you are almost invisible. So we were actually not hunting, we were fishing. So we were in this dugout canoe and there's, I think about three of us in the canoe. And I have something that I'm holding in, in my hand, which is probably something from a vine. I don't know what it is, but at the end of it is something like a hook. And you wait, the fish come up to the, are coming up closer to the surface of the water because the moon is out and they like the light. That's the assumption. And then just as they get to a certain place, I guess you, we must have had some kind of bait on that hook. Anyway, you jerk it and then you catch the fish in its mouth. So then we were bringing in fish, but what we didn't realize was that at the time we were doing this, very engrossed in what we were doing, our fishing, we were being hunted by cannibals and they were behind some bushes along this water where we were fishing. And we were fishing close in where the reeds were because that's where there were a lot of fish. And suddenly these, actually I saw a flash of the, somebody's eyes moving. So right away there was the alarm, but it was too late and they were upon us. And, you know, we would have been killed and become a meal for them. However, a young man out of this tribe that was hunting us sort of recognized me. He immediately sort of remembered me. So let's assume that this is someone that I've been reincarnating with over the millennia. In any case, it had this sense of him recognizing me and he couldn't kill me and he couldn't eat me. And he happened to be the chief's son. And because of his status, basically he could get away with what he wanted. And so he made me his wife. So I became this wife among this tribe that was used to being cannibals, except that this experience had such a far reaching effect on my young husband that from our point of view, it appeared as if anyway for us, he invented agriculture and therefore there wasn't such a need to kill people for food. And I should explain that I was a much smaller person 
than the people of his tribe. So I was shorter by a, a foot or so. The people of my tribe tended to be smaller people, and maybe they thought that we were, they could sort of separate themselves from thinking that we were also people and therefore they could hunt us because we were smaller. Or maybe that's not even a consideration. In any case, I had this memory when I went to a hypnotherapist to lose weight. And the reason this lifetime came up was because I was smaller and that whole lifetime, I wanted to be big like his tribe were. So after we had agriculture and we were actually growing crops, I remember standing in this sort of the middle of um, the, the compound, there were round huts that had, I don't know what are those, rushes, reeds, whatever, some kind of dried vegetation on all the rooftops. And then there was this central um, dirt area. And we had these places where you had a, a big stick and it was thicker at the bottom and you'd bang it to, to um, you know how they say, separating the wheat from the chaff, except it wasn't wheat that we had. It was some other kind of grain. So this was part of what we did. And while I was banging that grain, I was thinking I want to be bigger like everyone else. And so in this lifetime, I was bigger. However, I was wider and um, chubbier and had to deal with weight issues. I didn't get much taller. I've been a pretty short person throughout this lifetime. So I did say that in this particular lifetime, I also had the experience of my death. And when I was dying, I have to say here now, this lifetime of the many lifetimes that I remembered was my sweetest lifetime. And it was because my husband loved me so much and deeply and abidingly. I suspect that I might have been only one of his wives. I think he might have had four, three or four of us. And that was, we, we would stand there together as we were pounding on the grain. But it didn't make me feel any less loved for whatever reason. I'm not sure about that. Nonetheless, when I was dying, I was on sort of a raised platform. He was sitting beside me. It was dark at night. To my surprise, he was holding my hand in front of everybody in the tribe. It wasn't a large tribe, but he was holding my hand. He was showing publicly the love he had for me. Everyone else in the tribe was gathered around. Like I said, it didn't seem to be more than about 30 people. It included children. It included um, nursing babies. Uh, and they were all there loving me and helping me to make the transition. There was only love surrounding me. It was a wonderful experience. When I looked up at him, I guess until that moment, I really didn't understand what was going on with me that I was dying. But I looked up and saw that he had mud in his hair. And then I knew I must be dying because I, in that time, not at this time, I've never heard of putting mud in your air in this lifetime to, as an expression of grief. I never heard of putting mud in your air in any case. When I looked up at him in that dim light, uh, there was a moon out again. I knew then that I must be dying because he was grieving my passing. 
And interestingly enough, as soon as I died, I was so happy because there was my older sister who had died before me. And I hadn't seen her for years. And I missed her so much. And it was just a fantastic reunion. And this young woman that I saw when I died in that lifetime, she turned out to be my daughter in this lifetime. And it was interesting because whether she was my African lifetime or whether she was my daughter in this present American lifetime, I recognized her. I knew who she was. It's not like I even saw her after I died. I only saw darkness. I didn't go through a tunnel the way they say many people do. I just saw her and knew it was her and was very, very happy to see her again. Now I have, before I go on, because next I'm gonna tell you about how I found something from this lifetime that was a confirmation that what I had experienced could be true. And before I go on to that, I wanna talk a little bit about cannibalism because I'm afraid that if you're watching this, you're gonna say, oh, it's those Africans, you know, they're just so below us. They were such cannibals, you know, there's there's even, I remember, uh, was it Jack Benny, Bob Hope, they had some kind of skit where they're in a big cauldron and uh, the Africans are cannibals. And it made it out as if it's Africans who are these lowly people who are cannibals. But the reality is, I was doing some research on this. For one thing, I found out that in the Crusades, everyone thinks of the Crusaders as being such valiant knights helping Europe to keep Christianity alive. There was cannibalism that the Crusaders, um, they, they ate people that they'd killed. Evidently, they were hungry and they ate them. Then there's going to be a link in the description here to the article about that. Plus, in the 1680s in Europe, and for sure, this memory I had, because it was before white people were in Africa. So therefore, it wouldn't have been as recent as 1680. And so uh, Europeans came to Africa in the 1400s. And to give you an idea of what the 1400s were like in Europe, in the 1400s, they were experiencing the Black Death or the plague. However, in Africa, which is where my memory is, I don't know if it was the 1400s, but I know it was before that time, we were really healthy and beautiful people, strong, healthy, nice skin, bright eyed people. However, in Europe in the 1400s, they were having a rough time. One third of the population of Europe died because of that great plague. So in 1680, however, at a time when we think Europe is mm, becoming quite modern, were we going into the Industrial Re uh, Revolution by that time? I think so. In any case, in the 1680s, the big rave, there was a, it had grown to feverish pitch, according to an online article, was to eat dried mummy skin and muscle. Basically, there was quite a business in digging out Egyptian mummies 
and grinding their flesh up and then putting it into these vials that were sold as medicine in Europe. And in fact, it got to be such a rage that people were digging, grave robbers were digging up people out of graves in Europe and using their dead flesh to feed to people as medicine. So don't go thinking because we're talking about people in Africa that they were somehow not as smart, not as healthy, all these guys, not necessarily is what I'm saying. Evidently, according to this article I read, as late as 1910, there's still some people alive. No, there aren't people alive in, from who were born in 1910, but it's pretty recent, 1910 is pretty recent. There was a catalog in Germany, someone found a catalog in Germany still listing mummy as medicine. All right, so that was something really important that I needed to clarify right here and now. So how did I, I was really surprised. I went to Egypt in the year 2000 and I went there to find images in the Pharaoh's tombs that looked like my memories of what I'd experienced in Atlantis. I'd seen these images in a book and now I was going to Egypt to find those images that I'd seen. I had to see them with my own eyes. And by a series of very fortuitous circumstances, me and my friend were staying with a family in Cairo, Egypt. Because of our visit, their housekeeper, who was a young woman from Sudan, had worn her native dress, which was wonderful. And I took a picture of her, and it's in my book, Arrival of the Gods in Egypt. Her name was Christina. I don't know if you can even see that picture of her. But it was striking to me when I saw Christina because she looked like the people in our tribe. And remember, she's from Sudan. Especially that three-quarter profile of her, just her, her face there. And what struck me especially was how her hair looked because this was the kind of hair my husband in the past life memory had that he had put the mud in. So I distinctly remembered a hair of that length and about that curliness, but it had dirt in it. Well, you know how it is with women. When we get together, we start talking about emotional things that have happened with us and for us and through, through us in our lives. It was the same with us. And Christina, even though English was probably her third language, she had, uh, you know, an ability in Arabic and her original Sudanese language and then some English. She told us of this terrible tragedy that happened to her. And it was during a war. There was some kind of terrible virus going around, hardly any food to eat, hardly any water and her two beloved children died the same night, if I remember correctly. And without thinking, I said, and did you put mud in your hair? And she said, of course. And I was like, oh my God, could it be that that past life memory of mine was real? Because I had never heard of people putting mud or dirt in their hair as an expression of grief. 
I have looked it up for today's live stream and I did find that it's not that unusual and there's even indications of it in the Bible in the Old Testament. But for me, that was a real revelation that there was a possibility that what I had remembered was true. Hope you've enjoyed this. If you have, if you liked it, please tap that like button. And if you haven't been here before and enjoy the topics of past lives, memories of Atlantis, and nature spirits, please subscribe. Now, next week, which is going to be March 16th, I'm going to be talking, excuse me, I'm going to be talking about my memories of Atlantis, which I alluded to already. So if you have memories of Atlantis, please join me at that time. I would love to have input from you in the chat. Or if you want to email me ahead of time, it's carol at carolchapmanlive.com. Great talking with you. See you next week. Toodaloo.